Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man podcast. Uh, this week is another Marine Mammal Highlights, and my name is Cindy. I'm Trevor. I'm Kat. And this week we are doing the Northern Fur Seal, and this was a, a very tight, a nail-biting race <laughs> on our Instagram post. Uh, I think it only won by one. Is that yeah, right? Just yeah. by one. So versus the Monk Seal, and we are actually all kind of surprised. We thought the Monk Seal was going to going to win but uh you guys you came through with the northern first seal yeah i thought the first would win easily but i guess not. yeah so i guess everybody <laughs> I think trevor was the only one <laughs> you know we're all like ah the monk seal's gonna win it's gonna be the, the landslide uh we were wrong so so that's the northern first seal today um and we've actually learned quite a bit i think all of us uh learned some new things about these guys yeah. which was really fun um not that we know everything about every marine mammal because we don't but <laughs> this one in particular, I think we learned a little bit more than we, than we normally do. So Trevor's gonna start us off with the introduction. Yeah, so I'll talk about their range and what they look like and all that, should you find one. Um, so in Washington, at least we have seals and sea lions. So lots of harbor seals, but very few elephant seals, tons of cellar and California sea lions, but we also get the Northern fur seal. Um, mm -hmm. It is, we are technically part of their range which is including Southern California all the way to Alaska. And it's a very similar range on the Western Pacific as far south as Japan. Um, yeah, I find it funny that like the Northern fur seal that they're found in California. <laughs> yeah. It's actually really similar, I read, to the stellar sea lion range. Um, okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if they've been seen in Hawaii or not, but I know that they're off the coast a lot. Like most of their life is in the ocean. Right. So I'm sure you get probably some vagrants out there, but yeah, they're probably like, I'm just gonna stop in Hawaii for for a little bit, but not, not too long for a little right. vacation. <laughs> yeah, you know. But yeah, about the same latitude line of, of Japan and California is about where they stop, mm -hmm. and they are the only w one of the two only fur seals that are found in the northern hemisphere. The other being the Guadalupe fur seal, which is barely right. in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> I think, but we even have we even get those up here sometimes, which is yeah. weird. Exactly. I think their southern range overlaps with their northern range, I think it was. Oh, that would make sense if they have like a little bit of overlap yeah. there and that's northern and then southern right. is the Guadalupe fur seal. Um, but if you do see a fur seal, if you think it is one, it is smaller than our big stellars um, and generally darker colored. So yeah. similar color to California sea lions, but furrier, I guess you could say. <laughs> I think there would maybe a little bit, like just the color is a little bit darker than the, more of a yeah. chocolate than a, more of a dark chocolate than a milk chocolate. <laughs> Actually, the males are a slightly different coloration than the females as well. Oh, that's right. So I can kind of go into coloration for that. Yes. So that's kind of part of the sexual dimorphism. Um, mm -hmm. The big part of that is the males are way larger than the females. Yeah, I think quite it was a bit. up to four times larger. So the males can weigh around 600 pounds and get to seven feet long versus the females are only 120-ish pounds on average. Wow. You know, there's, you know, yeah. bigger, smaller. They're very and stealth. They're really stealth. Yeah. 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 Uh, the males are generally really dark brown um, with some, some dark grays, but a lot of dark brown. But the females, they have a darker and back, but their chest and underside is more gray or cream colored. Oh, so more interesting. Tone. Yeah. So they, I mean, it, the variation, there is variation in coloration with the females, but in general, say you see a young male versus a female, you can kind of tell based on the coloration. Wow. That's interesting. Cause I mean, the two tone coloration that you get there is common for top predators and stuff because it's, you know, from below, you want it to be light. So you blend in with the light above you. And from above, you want to be dark. So you blend in with the dark below you. Um, so it's interesting that only the females really have that. I wonder yeah. what that, what's the reason for that. That would kind of make sense though, because the females, if they're that much smaller, they would be a more likely prey item than something oh. that's like 600 pounds <laughs> and seven feet long. True, true. 
<laughs> so, I mean, yeah, you know, that on. actually does kind of make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that does. Yeah. They are all males and females are all black when they're born, too. Yeah, they're much different color when they're okay. born than when they grow up. Yeah, so they'll yeah. all be born black, and then from there, the coloration will change based on genes okay. and all that. Right, hormones and stuff. Right. Um, these guys, you know, fur seal, they have amongst the densest fur in the pinnipeds. I mean, obviously, not pinniped, but sea otters have the densest fur of marine mammals and all mammals, I believe. Yes, I yeah, they're the top of all. That's a million hairs per square inch for a sea otter. Right. Ridiculous. These guys have a really thick undercoat with an overcoat that, with longer hairs. Mm-hmm. And it covers most of the body, but there's a really distinct line at the wrist of the flippers. Uh, the hair just stops, and then it's just like skin. Gotcha. It's like they have short sleeve shirt on. Yeah, that's another way to ID them too. If you're out out and about, I mean they're mm-hmm. rare here, but if you just see one hauled out and you just see the fur stark line on the flipper, there you go. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. there it's something like th- three. Is it three hundred thousand hairs yeah. per square inch? Yeah. Yeah. So still yeah. pretty good. Um, I guess another cool thing about these guys is they have the longest flippers of the pinnipeds. So they have, yeah. the, there's like elongated cartilage on their toes, essentially. Really? It's increasing the length of their <laughs> flippers. Well, and I guess you, you would want That's it to have cool. some kind of stiff because if they're just floppy, <laughs> it's yeah, not going to work well for swimming. So you need it to have a little quick, bit they of... Can, they can run on land too, you know, compared to a seal that scooches, they can actually run. <laughs> they can run faster than you. Yeah, they said they could run fast. I saw that. They run faster on rocks. They can run faster than humans can. Yeah. Which is a little terrifying. Thanks. Did he get like a mile an hour at all or? I didn't see one. I didn't see one yet. I didn't see one either. I just just wondered. I was like, ooh, that would be kind of cool to know. Yeah, and I wonder, so they said on on Rocky Island that, you know, on rocks and stuff, they would go faster than humans. But I wonder what what would the race be if it was flat? Like, could we still outrun it then? Are they just have that advantage over the Rocky? Because we're not good on Rocky. Maybe not against, like, Usain Bolt or anything. (laughs) (laughs) Unfair advantage. Maybe you're average human, yeah. (laughs) Not fair. Interesting. Yeah, very cool. I think their flippers, too, they said it was, like, what, like a quarter of their body length? Yeah, it Maybe. was a quarter of their total body length. So, I mean, crazy. generally the sea lions and fur seals have long flippers, but the fact that it's a quarter of your length is kind of nuts. Yeah, and they're obviously flippers. strong. They can support that much weight. You know, six. Yeah, they're, like, they're not just floppy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those elephant seals in the south, those 8,000 pound males, they could luck supporting that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's what they look like. And like I said, we get a few in here i mean more along the coast and the breeding colonies that i think cindy will talk about more mm-hmm. um but going back on their fur their population is rebounding a little bit but it took a major hit a few centuries ago with the fur trade mm-hmm. so i think primarily in alaska there is a huge demand for fur seal pelts because obviously of the fur right and what I have here from 1786 to 1867, an estimated 2.5 million northern fur seals were killed for the fur trade. It's insane. Probably it's amazing they we... survived it all. Yeah. I mean, I assume that's because when we thought that it was just an un- or a reliable resource that would just continue right. to replenish itself. We can just kill as many as possible and it'll be fine. <laughs> right? No we're cold. Help. Well, and I think um, it is that that thing, that idea of like, you know, we're doing it and we're a small, wh- whoever's doing it, well, we're just doing it here. But if everybody's doing that and not, th- it's that tragedy of the commons, right? Nobody's overseeing it and everybody's just like, I'm just taking this amount. That's not much. But when you add it up, 2.5 million. Especially when- And then it becomes a commodity. Right. So- Especially when it takes a few years for them to mature and then they only have one pup and then that's not even a hundred percent survival rate for the pup. And right. Yeah. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Um, I think now we have, I think the last estimate I just looked at was 1.1 million fur seals spread out, you know, from Japan, Alaska, West Coast of America. Um, And that's just based on breeding colonies and cows from there. And because they all come in the winter to breed, I think, I think it's winter. Cindy will talk about that. But yeah, I'll talk about that. um, So basically once we were killing them all, we realized there's less because we're killing them all. (laughs) (laughs) They're getting um, harder to find. I wonder why. Yeah, right. <laughs> so a few countries that were the primary countries responsible for the killings, like Japan, Russia, you know, that curve of countries mm-hmm. and Canada, they signed the Northern Pacific Fur Seal Convention of 1911 to help manage the fur seal population in the Bering Sea, 
which I will let Cindy expand upon that. Yeah, so we have basically their, their ranges Trevor was talking about is the North Pacific on the east and west coast of, oh, or the east and west part of the ocean. Um, and then the Bering Sea, which is up, up north of that around Alaska and um, whatnot. And so the, the main population um, is in the Pribilof Islands, which I had to look at where that was because I did, I'm not good at geography. So I was like, oh, it's up by the Aleutians, up by, in, in Alaska. Um, and so that's the main, that the, the, like kind of the biggest colony that they had. Um, and uh, so, like you said, in 1911, they had the first seal treaty. So that sounds great. Like we're gonna stop killing these animals. No, that was, means we're not gonna kill them at sea. <laughs> So we're not going to take them out of the water, but if you're on land, all is fair, all is fair in love and war. You mean where so, it's easier? <laughs> go ahead. Where it's easier to kill them too on land. Right, yeah. Exactly. I'm like, great. So it's you, you. You're not doing it in the place that it's harder to find them, harder to get. Them. Okay. I guess it's good because you're not killing them at some point, so that's a good thing. But what I thought was really interesting is that so that's 1911, and so they did realize at that point that you know, they're over harvesting and whatnot and they're trying to do better, okay. But they didn't stop um, killing them on the islands in the Pribilof Islands in particular until 1984, which- Right, so that's a good like 70 years later. <laughs> and that's right? after and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, right? Yeah, the Marine Mammal Protection yeah. Act was in the, in the 70s, in 1972, right, yeah. the MMPA. Yeah. So it, I, just, I, I, I guess my generation, um, I think at least, I don't think, I think of whaling and that as before me, not realizing that it whaling and, and these pin, kill, kill, killing of pinnipeds went up through the eighties, you know, and I was young mm -hmm. in the, when I was in the eighties, but um, it's just mind blowing to me that, that it, it's still that recent that people were still doing it commercially I mean, yeah. Uh, harvesting. Yeah, there is um, still some, you know, like some tribal. Um, there's still subsistence. Yeah, there's still subsistence. Yeah, subs yeah, yeah. subsistence. And that's Which I'll true talk for about a little bit. Yeah, that's true for most marine mammal species, whether you're cetaceans or pinnipeds, um, yeah. that is still allowed. Um, but, you know, at least, okay, so good 1984. So since then, the populations have been getting better and they have, um, there's some other new populations that are popping up um, down in California by San Miguel and a couple of these other islands like St. George and things like that. Um, some of these other populations are doing a little bit better now um, that we've stopped killing them. I just, yeah. And I'll talk a little bit more about like the what is impacting them today in terms of threats and what a little bit more about the status of them as well in my section. Perfect. So um, I think with that, we are going to take a quick break and we will return and I'll be talking about uh, the behavior and the diet and the behavior is super fun talking about mm -hmm. stuff on the I know I'm so excited. Comments. Yeah, it's very cool. So we will be right back. Okay, and we are back, and now we're going to be going into the um, behavior and the diet, uh, which is super interesting. Um, so I kind of joke with this one. I'm like, they live a double life because they're basically solo guys, right? They're they're they spend most of their time by themselves out in the open ocean. You know, eighty percent of their time at sea is is at sea, like. That's a lot of your life just floating around. And I know Kat's going to talk about a cool thing about how you, how you rest and like, what, what do you do when you're out there in the ocean for 80% of your of Right. Your how does that even work? <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so, but, but everybody needs to have, have some friends and get together every once in a while. So um, when they do come onto shore, they come in to congregate at the breeding colonies for a few months out of, out of the year. Um, and for, they give birth, they nurse and they mate before they head back out for the rest of the year. Um, so even the solitary guys need some need some time to hang out together. Um, so they basically spend the winter and the spring in the Bering and the North Bering Sea in the North Pacific Ocean. Um, they uh, when they dive, they don't dive as deep as a lot of the other um, sea, seals and sea lions that we've talked about, especially sea lions. Um, they only dive to about 200 feet on average, um, hmm. and their max dive is like 600. So they don't really go very far because they don't need to. What I thought was really interesting when we were looking at the food is that I was like listing out what they ate. And I'm like, all of these are like the same things that harbor porpoises eat. <laughs> it's very similar. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it was really interesting. I was like, oh, uh, there's a competitors here. 
Um, so their diet, they're opportunistic and generalistic. They'll eat lots of different things, but, um, and they're, what they eat will change depending on where they are and what time of year and what is available. But mainly it consists of what they call midwater shelf fish. So those on the, on the mid continental shelf, um, walleye pollock, Pacific sand lance, Pacific herring, all of those are harbor porpoise food. Um, Northern smooth tongue, uh, a mackerel, uh, as called an Atka mackerel, um, Pacific, and Pacific salmon. Also, we know now know that harbor porpoises eat salmon. Um, and then also squid species. So I thought it was interesting how much uh, correlated there was with that. Yes. Do they eat while they nurse their pups? They do, and I'll talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So the, male, the males don't, but uh, well, obviously the males yeah. aren't nursing, but during that time... <laughs> The, uh, the females do, uh, do eat, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, uh, and also interesting, their behavior are around in the ocean also mirrors harbor porpoises and a lot of other marine mammals uh, in that they will concentrate around oceanographic features. So things like eddies and frontal boundaries, where you get this, you know, those riptides and things like that. Um, because the prey congregate there. And a lot of times also it's easier for them to catch the prey because there's kind of like a wall <laughs> of water stream. Actually put a, put a pin in put that pin part because I'll come back to that in, uh, in the threat section. Excellent, excellent. Because that's, that's all mm -hmm. I had to say about that. So that's perfect. Yeah, no, that's actually, that's a really important point. Okay, interesting. So keep, keep your mind on that when uh, we get to cat section. Um, and they are mainly nocturnal. So they forage at night. So they rest during the day and, and, and forage at night. So, um, hmm? I just, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, I know. I was, I, I didn't think of that either, but it's hmm. uh, apparently a thing. Um, and to some degree it has to do, uh, I was always oh, reading something else with another pinniped species, but it was about like, when do you rest and when do you, um, actually I think it was the monk's seal, uh, when, when you rest and when you f forage and the risks that are associated with that. So perhaps it has. Right. To that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, when it when it's more safe or when there's more food. Um, so the the I'm going to talk about the time frame, kind of give you the story about what happens as they come out of the ocean. So in late May is when the males return to the breeding sites, and because they are territorial breeders, um, they basically have to go and stake out their territory. So the males show up first before the females do, um, and they pick out their little area that they're going to defend. Do they return to the same spot, or do they find a new spot every year? So that's, well, so I don't know, but- Okay, males, I wasn't sure if that was- Yeah, and that's a good point. So, so I think females may do that more and it's, and it's more about what the females choose than the males, which we'll talk about in a second. So, okay. Um, okay. so I think there might be some of that there, um, but I'm, I don't know, know for sure. Okay. So yeah, so the, so the males will come up and they don't, they don't have a lot of time that they actually are breeding, which I'll talk about in a second, which <laughs> also means that they may not care about where they are. Um, so, uh, they, um, they will aggressively defend these territories, right? So, um, their ability to mate with females once they show up, um, depends on their body size, their fighting ability, their size, the size and location of the territory. So the larger territory you stake out, the harder it is for you to be able to, um, defend that with whatever females are there. Um, and it, so that mentioning that before, it turns out the females don't choose individual males, but they choose breeding areas. So okay. I think females are like, I like this area and whatever male is able to defend this area is the male I'm going to like. Interesting. Yeah. Which I thought was really cool. Cause most of the time it's like, you see yeah. them fighting and it's like, oh, that's the male I'm going to go with. Cause he's the biggest and the strongest and he wins the fights, but. Right. Yeah. That's really fascinating that it's more advantageous to actually stake out the location that you want. And then whoever's there is fine. Exactly. I think that's wow. similar to the, I think it was the California sea lions. I think the males basically determine a range of the beach like that rock's their end right that rock is theirs and then the females are there great but yeah whoever's there right. that's what i'm gonna mate with but yeah and so to some degree that is choosing the male because whoever can can adequately defend that area is better but it yeah. is more about the area than the male which is hmm. cool. very cool yeah um and also it has to do with their skills with interacting with females so there's some socialness to this if you're a little bit too gruff, maybe the females aren't going to be receptive, you know, things like that. Interesting. Um, so breeding males are usually about 10 years or older. And again, as I said, they're very aggressive on land. So like, you don't want to mess with the male for seal that's defending its territory. Like, yeah. and remember that how fast they can run. Yeah, you don't want to, <laughs> don't want to do that. So they will um, push and bite other males when defending their territories and sometimes to the death. 
So it's, they're pretty intense. Yeah. Um, uh, so then, so that's, that's a, it's a rough for these guys, but on top of that, they don't feed during the breeding time, whereas the females will. So they are fasting for on average about 46 days. So probably in between like 40 to 60 days that they are not eating. Um, and they can lose up to 20 to 32% of their body mass. So, which makes a lot more sense when you then, when you put that into context of they have to continuously defend this spot or they lose all right. their females. Exactly. That like makes if they went out to eat, they, they, they lose their territory. That's it. Right. So, wow. You got to stick it out. Guys. So you got to, you got to have done good eating before you get there <laughs> and then still maintain your strength and ability to defend after losing a third of your body weight. It's just kind of crazy. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so because of that, I thought this was interesting. They're, the time that they actually get to breed is on average only two breeding seasons. Oh, for their whole uh, life? For the whole life. So males can live up to like 13 to 18 years and females, I think it was like 19 to 27 or something like that. Um, so they live a fair amount of time, but they're really only breeding for like two years, which I thought was really- that like They're not mature till 10, you know? Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So they have a couple of years and then they have a couple of years after that. And then that's, that's it. And is that just a factor of they can't outcompete once they get beyond a certain age and probably a certain amount of battle scars and whatnot that they have injury or. Yeah. I would assume that, that just that there's so many new males, you know, up and coming males that are stronger, that there's only so much time that you can really, uh, uh, you know, defend that. Um, wow. Yes. That's harsh. I know. Right. <laughs> I was like, this guy's got it. Males got it tough, man. Yeah. Um, and most of the mating is accomplished by only a few males each season. So it's, you, you really have to be at the top of your game. And I guess that kind of goes into that as well. You have to be at the top, otherwise you don't breed. So there's only a short amount of time you're going to be able to keep that. Mm -hmm. So wow, it's a tough being, being a male there. Um, so that, so the, um, the, there is another option. We always, we've talked about some of these before where it's like a sneaky male, um, yeah. where they kind of come in and like... <laughs> don't, don't say anything. I'm not here and try to sneaky mate with the females and then run off. Um, but basically you have the, the males and the, the breeding males in their territories in the middle. And then you have on the fringes of the colony, you have these not, um, these uh, idle males that don't aren't, you know, territorial. Um, and then you have outside of that, these haulouts uh, that have juvenile males that, you know, aren't ready to breed yet. And they just hang out next to the breeding area doing their little juvenile thing. It's like the teenager hangout area. Um, but for those males on the fringes that aren't territorial at the moment, um, when the breeding males leave in August, the males can, those males can actually move in with, while the females are still there. Mm. So they have the possibility of mating. The problem is, and I'll talk about this in a second, is that the females have most likely already mated. <laughs> so you might be able to get some sneak in there, but it's less likely that you're actually going to end up uh, mating, but I guess you could practice your uh, social skills with the females, right? Yeah. I was going to say, I wonder if that's actually more of a societal thing there too, and like behavioral rather than like necessarily a fitness progression. It's like this right. is me learning how to interact and right. So maybe maybe figuring out which spots are the really hot spots for the females and where do I need to kind of mm -hmm. stake out once I get bigger. Yeah, so, yeah, so like a learning process of mm. what you need to do when you can fight for it. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So are they mature and the males mature at 10 years old or are they just big enough at 10 years old to defend harems? That's a good question. I think they might be sexually mature a little bit before that. Because I'm wondering about sneaker males maybe are the younger ones too getting their first shot essentially. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, as they're, you know, I don't, they didn't have a time frame of or age of when those sneaker males would be, you know, going in there. Um, but they're the idle males that aren't the non-territorial ones. So I think they would be younger and not ready to, to do that. Yeah. Okay. So a quick Google says that they are, they become sexually mature typically between four to five, yep. but they typically don't start mating until, until they're nine to 10. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I thought, I wasn't sure what the actual age was, but I thought that they did um, sexually mature earlier. Um, and that's kind of, that's common in, in quite a few, even cetacean species too, where you, you can be physically mature, but you're not socially mature yet to be able to actually mate. Um, yeah. for example, spotted dolphins in the Bahamas, you know, they're sexually mature, you know, much younger, but the, most of the, um, uh, the ones that father the animals, the, the babies are older, older individuals. Well, it makes sense if you have to fight that hard to get any space on there too. 
Exactly. And there's only going to be the couple that wow. actually get to meet with everybody and you can't beat them until you've, you know, figured that out, <laughs> gotten big enough to See, do it. learning stuff left, right, and center, guys. Yeah. So now this, this blew my mind. So it's hard enough for the males, right? Now, the, now you got the females, which is hard enough to be pregnant. If, and any of you out there have been pregnant, it's tough. Raising kids is tough, right? So pregnant females arrive on the breeding sites in late June and they will give birth within on average 1.3 days of arrival. Jesus. Yeah. What? Their timing is like, okay, I'm here. Let's go. Huh. <laughs> I don't know wow. how they time that so well. That's nuts. Isn't it? And that's not even the craziest part. So they give birth, right? Uh, females give birth at five to six years of age. That's when they're, they're earliest, all the way up until 23 years. So they have a, a fairly long ability to, hmm. to birth, have calves, uh, have not calves, <laughs> pups. Pops. Um, but their prime years are between eight and 13. So that's their best time. Um, so, but they don't waste, uh, speaking of time, they don't waste any time. So they give birth within one day or so of landing there. And then they mate within 5.3 days of giving birth. Like, I can't even wow. fathom that. Like, <laughs> good Lord. Like you just gave birth and now within a week you're mating again. Right. Does this keep going? Right. Yeah. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so wow, there's no rest for the weary. That's crazy. For these guys, right. Um, and so it, they're really, like other pinniped species that have, um, this is my favorite term that I learned, embryonic diapause, which I think is awesome. Um, we more we more often call it delayed implantation. It's a little bit easier term to think about. One of the coolest things in the marine mammal world ever. Right. It is cool. So the fertilized egg basically doesn't implant uh, until into the uterus until after lactation or weaning because they need to obviously be very tight in their timing when they you know have a nine month ish gestation. If they implanted right away, they would be giving birth too early before they're ready to come on land in the summer. So they basically wait for that, you know, it's about three or four months that they'll be um, lactating um, so that then it implants basically when they go back out to the ocean, you have nine months, they come back and they can give birth right at the right time. Wow. Yeah. So crazy. Um, so pups are nursed for about five to six days. And then of course the mothers do need to go out and, and feed. So in some pinniped species, they are fasting during nursing, but these guys don't. So five to six days, then the mothers head out to feed for anywhere from 3.5 to 9.8 days. Um, and that cycle continues for the four month nursing period. And I know Kat's gonna say something really cool about how um, mothers and pups and stuff. Um, so they are basically gone for five or six days out for three to nine days and back and forth for about four months. Um, the pups will leave the breeding site uh, before their mothers to feed independently for the first time um, once they're a little bit old enough. Um, and females don't always get along, but again, colonies, they're all like on top of each other, next to each other. So there is some, some fighting between females, but it's much less aggressive, much more mild. Um, and mainly, mainly it's threats. So it's like the open mouth. So they're just like, ah, get off my, get out of my that face, call. get out of my face. And then right. you know, not really much pushing and biting like the males do. Um, so, uh, that's the, that's, that's what I have about their behavior. I just thought it's tough being a so first cool. one, <laughs> whether you're a male or a female, there's <laughs> no rest for the weary and you got a lot to deal with. The so. added human hunts from years ago didn't help you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? So then, yeah, you, then you're out at sea, you're getting hunted. Then you go to the colonies, you're getting hunted. And then, you know, there's, it's a tough life for, for the pups to survive in the first place, let alone with everything else going on. So it's yeah. wonder that yeah. they, their populations kind of crashed. So, um, I'm yeah. excited, super excited for cat section because yeah, really cool stuff. Right. So, so first of all, yeah, let's talk about their, their current status. Um, so as Trevor said, the, the current estimate is around about 1.1 million worldwide. Um, and while the population has kind of stabilized, I mean, they're, you know, like, like we already talked about their populations were diminished by almost 50%. Like there was a huge crash over that, um, that fur trade period of time. Um, there is some indication that their numbers are actually declining a little bit. Um, and I'll talk about why in just a moment. Um, so they are currently listed by the IUCN as a vulnerable. Um, so their status is listed as vulnerable. And they are, as, as we already mentioned, they are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, throughout their range. And so the, the Pribilof or Pribilof Islands um, that we already discussed off the west coast of Alaska, that's where over three quarters of the entire population are found in those islands. Yeah, like that's it. So, like that's the main. 
That's a huge part of the population. Um, and only, that, oh, go ahead. Oh, wasn't there only like five or six breeding colonies? Yeah. 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 Very few. yeah. So yeah, like Cindy already mentioned a few, but, and there are some that are newly established, like we already yeah. said, but the fact that you have such a huge proportion in one area is a little concerning, just as we've discussed before, if you're putting all your eggs in that basket, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a gamble. Um, well, and then we didn't stop hunting them on those islands until 1984. Exactly. Like <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And there's the, so the, the Pribilof Island slash Eastern Pacific stock. So they're now considered one main stock, um, was only listed as depleted under the MMPA in 1988. So that's even, you know, that's even later until that right. particular stock was listed as being depleted. So again, some of this probably has to do with our understanding of what the stocks are, what the numbers are, getting good enough counts to really realize there's an issue. Right. But still, <laughs> yeah. come on, guys. Um, and, you know, as we already discussed as well, the, the, that subsistence harvest is still going on. Um, and granted, it's not a ton of animals that are being taken out of the population, at least in the United States waters and the kind of Alaskan and Canadian waters. It seems like there are likely more animals taken on the Asian Pacific side, um, which may or may not be due to just, you know, poor regulation or just people doing it when they're not supposed to be. Who knows? Um, so the last no estimate for the, this, uh, Pribilof Island and Eastern Pacific stock specifically was from 2017. And that contained, um, around about 650,000 fur seals yeah, out of 1.1 million on the colonies. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about what the issues are in and why their populations may be in slight decline at this point. So in addition to that, you know, subsistence harvest that is still ongoing, one of the main ones for these guys is entanglement. So they are severely at risk in um, basically because of where they are and what they're feeding on. They're really highly susceptible to entanglement in fishing gear, either active fishing gear or abandoned gear as well. Mm -hmm. um, particularly susceptible to drift nets and trawling, um, as well as the monofilament nets, which are really, they can't see it, basically. Right. Um, and so th you actually I think, have... I think I've seen like a lot of pictures that I see for pinniped species that are entangled are, I think, fur seals, now that I think yeah. about it. Especially yeah. if it's and open a lot water. Of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Open water, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that is because they are fishing on prey species that commercial fishermen are also going after. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but the other thing is a lot of this stuff, they can still move with it on them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like we have this issue with some of the larger cetacean species too, a large, the larger whales where they can continue to move, even though they have these things stuck on them. But over time, that leads to increased fatigue. They can't forage right. as well. They obviously can't mate and defend territory very well if they have like tons and tons of fishing gear hanging off them. And eventually mm -hmm. that often leads to the death either from that prolonged fatigue and not being able to feed or the immediate trauma caused by the entanglement. So and that's probably, actually quite a large problem. There's probably indirect effects too. Like if the net's cutting into them, maybe that there's an open wound that gets infected. Right, and stuff like infection, that. exactly. Well, exactly. and then if you have a male that isn't quite up and coming yet, and he never gets a chance to breed. Even if he survives right. those things, he's not gonna be able to be strong enough to do that. Right, and then if you attempt to try to defend a territory and you get into a fight with another male and you're already at a lower level of fitness, you know, it all right. just kind of spirals. So the other problem, like I said, to put a pin in earlier, when you talk about marine debris is that because they are a lot of times hanging out by these gyres and eddies in these particular mm. areas, and they're hanging out in the upper water column, that's where a lot of marine plastics, microplastics, yeah. any kind of marine debris and trash will get sucked into those so giants, whirlpool. right? Yeah. And that's exactly where they're foraging and spending 80% of their time. Makes total sense. Is in those open marine environments and they're, they're doing it in that upper water column, which is why it was so interesting when you were talking about their, their dive depth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's another huge there's, problem. There's a, constantly guys. in that area where there's going to be trash. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, the more activity that occurs up in those regions, you know, I mean, there is a lot of marine debris pushed up there just because of the ocean currents anyway, but the more we have additional human waste that's being tossed out of boats that are up there as well, right. the more likely that is to become a problem. So of course, they can swallow that, which can lead to death, they can build up of, of, of plastics in their body, which can lead to all kinds of 
hormonal and um, immune response problems um, as they're finding in some of the other cetacean species as well. Right, and we talked um, about that in one of our other podcasts about the microplastics that are being ingested. So that's yeah. You know, yeah. more things that are actually being found. Yeah, so there's that. Um, and then uh, the next one is changes in prey availability. So like I already said, they are fishing on a lot of the same species that commercial fishermen are also fishing for. Mm -hmm. um, so that leads to increase in entanglement risk, but also that means that there's a prey depletion happening as well. Um, so in addition to just the seasonal fluctuations that we see with all species based on you know climate, and they are one species that is more susceptible to climate change because of where they live, because they are in that kind of Northern region um, they're generalists, so that helps a little bit, but, um, if their prey are not where they're supposed to be, right. you can't eat, you know, and like you said, there's, there's a lot of incentive to be feeding really well when you are out in the open ocean for, for 80% of your life. Well, and then even um, like with harbor porpoises where they, they need, you know, consistent prey and, and to know where they are. If that's something that, that normally happens out there, they know these specific areas are where there's going to be food and that's what they know. And, and now if that's not happening, yeah, how do you find the needle in a haystack where it's you know moved to this other place over here, this new eddy or, new, or whatever. So if, they're, if their prey is being reduced in one area, it may be hard for them to find where the new one happens in the open ocean. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. It's like, you're then gonna spend a huge amount of energy searching mm -hmm. in the open ocean for these pockets of prey that, as you said, are normally in one place and just for whatever reason, they're not that year. So there also, there is a big link between climate change potentially shifting those prey stocks and the success of these guys. Mm. Um, the next one is contaminants. So like we already talked about the, the plastic issue, but in addition to that, they're also exposed to a lot of toxins from um, oil and gas development that's happening up in the Northern mm. regions, um, runoff from that development uh, any vessel discharge that's being basically like pumped out in the area. Um, vessel groundings and oil spills was another huge one. The, hmm. If any of you guys have been up there, the weather is atrocious. <laughs> like the storms yeah. that happen up there are Massive. insane. And so there's a lot of shipwrecks. There's a lot of, unfortunately, still vessels that go down and or, you know, break apart in those in those waters and so that can actually lead to contamination because all those all the liquids that are in that boat then leak out into the ocean. Um, including right. the oil and all the other various things that are used to run a vessel. Um, so the studies have shown that they are exposed to a wide range of toxins um, and as many top predators, you know, those toxins are accumulating in their bodily tissues. So again, if they then do have an issue with finding food, they metabolize those fats, which is where it's typically stored as into lipids, and then they dose themselves with the toxins. Well, and then you're going to have those females when they first have their first pups, those pups Absolutely. are probably going to have lower survival because they're dumping all of that into their milk. Absolutely. Yep. Um, ooh, in ooh, terms but of then, the, oh, but then also ooh. then, so then it's the same thing, you find that males will have higher toxin loads because they're not offloading it into the milk. So then that goes into, are those males less able to fight territories and stuff because they have those loads in them that may be having sick. issues. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. And as it's we've seen, compounding. that's a huge part of their fitness. Exactly, right. exactly. These guys have, like, there was so really much hard. that I learned by studying these guys. It's fascinating. Um, they have, like, all the things, all the things they have to deal with. Right, yeah. And then on top of that, they're also, you know, prey for killer mm -hmm. whales, mm -hmm. uh, sharks, also stellar sea lions, apparently. Oh, yeah, I read known, that. That was so great. Really? Yeah, yeah. So there's that. Um, <laughs> they don't and even get a break from their pinniped brethren like no on. kidding I mean and they are in the open ocean so you know killer whales and sharks are obviously much more common but which right. also that's what I mean where it, it would follow that then having that coloration difference for the females especially being smaller right yeah that would be beneficial for them especially Makes in sense. the open ocean um so other kind of additional threats that they are at risk of like I already mentioned the oil and gas exploration is kind of an up-and-coming one um just because of that mostly because of the rough sea conditions and the likelihood of, of increased oil spill risk, but also just the, you know, destruction of their habitat too, mm -hmm. um, especially for those haul out points. Human disturbance, um, increased vessel and aircraft traffic in the area, and then obviously the illegal killing or harvesting um, over and above the subsistence levels that are dictated. Right. So they have a lot of things going against them, which 
again, a lot of the, a lot of the ones we've already spoken about have some of the similar issues. You know, for for many marine mammals, we're talking about a lot of the same issues now. But these guys seem to have it slightly more, more so. intensified. <laughs> yeah, and um, every single thing. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty cool. They're kind of just they're they're like they're an intense pinniped. It's crazy. Yeah, on all, um, all aspects. Yeah. So okay, so let's end on a happier note. Some fun facts. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Not end on death, death, death. <laughs> right, right. Let's move along. So, first of all, their name. So, as Trevor already talked about, you know, these guys have very, very dense fur. But did you know that the Europeans actually, when they first saw these guys, they named them sea bears, which is so cute, <laughs> so adorable. Which, if you look at pictures of them, kind of makes sense, kind of like bears, right? Yeah. So they they actually do resemble bears, and especially when you're seeing them in those northern latitudes, you likely already had bears in that area, so that was a common point of reference. And their fur is kind of when they're kind of dry and it's like fluffed out. It definitely All looks fluffy. more bear-like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but even their Latin name reflects that. So their Latin name is calorinus or sinus which literally means bear like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so i thought that was really cool yeah everybody's um, like they're just like bears they're just cute bears yep yeah. and genetically apparently the the current thought is that they actually evolved from the same land ancestor that gave rise to both bears and dogs really so they're not even that far off given the mm. genetic evidence well yeah. i guess you know they are canines just like a dog is yeah right well and and, and with all the pinniped species the dog dog things can zoonotically transfer over from transfer. dog viruses can go to pinniped right. viruses. So yeah, it makes sense. Yep. <clears throat> so like Cindy already mentioned, they spend most of their lives in the open ocean um, and they can spend up to 22 months at sea at a time. Um, so yeah. those are typically the pups when they're not going back to breed. Um, yeah, they're like, I don't need to go back. I'm just going to go hang out here and be have fun in the ocean. <laughs> right, which makes sense. I mean, if that's where you're foraging and you're trying to rapidly build up your strength and your size, like you would just want to spend as much time as possible feeding. Um, yeah. But the fun little thing that we already put a hook in for you. So <laughs> how do they sleep? Right. <sighs> so we already know. We, right. So we've talked about with harbor seals, they can sleep at depth. You know, they can they can sleep up to 30 minutes underneath the water. Um, they also will sleep at the surface as well. But these guys sleep in what's called a jug handle position so and, basically and tell me why because i saw that i'm like okay. why is it called jug handling okay i got you so they flip on their back they'll stick their nose out and then they'll put both their hind flippers in the air and typically one front flipper only one presumably so they have one under the water to still maneuver if they need oh, to okay like a rudder so mm -hmm. when you actually look at pictures of this it looks like an old-fashioned jug that have those really nice curvy handles oh, just turned on its side like it it literally looks like an old fashioned curved jug handle. Oh, so we don't really okay. know why they do that, but it's thought that it's probably something to do with thermoregulation to, to right. be able to conserve their body heat. Well, um, and I was going to say that because like with rafting sea lions, they do that, they put one flipper out in the air and the other one's in the, still in the water for right. Right. Thermo -regula so a lot of times thermoregulation. To, yeah. So it can be either to, to lose heat, to, to, you know, allow excess heat to come off of you or to ensure that your body is not getting too cold being in a freezing open ocean. Right. So that's, there you go. So that's why they do it. And that's cool. why it's called that. Ah. Yeah. Um, and then the last one that I had is, um, as Cindy mentioned, the females and their pups. So they can actually, the females can recognize their pups by call, even after four years apart. So that's crazy. That's cool. Isn't that nuts? So that's literally like if they're on a beach pack full of fur seals, presumably some of your offspring are actually going to be there as well, maybe starting mm -hmm. to, to breed as well, um, or just coming back to haul out for a period of time and socialize a little bit. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. apparently studies have shown that they can still recognize individual pups after four years. Of being that's crazy. Because again, they're, you know, it's one season, right? That they, they, they do their pup and then, then they're gone. So like, there's yeah. no real reason that they should need to know except for maybe not to mate with them, but they're not going to be ready to mate anyway at that point. So it's really interesting I mean, I that think, they can continue that. I think the thing is they probably have to establish, I'm thinking it's probably something similar to penguins, right? So they have to establish a call that's known because they're, they're leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back when they first, yeah. first give birth to the pup. Right. So probably that they, they have to establish some known call that's unique to them and their pup at birth. And then, you know, presumably that just means that they, they can remember that call as they get older yeah well i think that's the thing is like okay so it makes sense that they need to do it because of that the way that they nurse and they have to go back out to feed for that season but the the ability the to remember it and to retain it yeah. like when you don't need to 
seemingly you don't need to know it three years later but the fact that they can and and do is really really interesting so maybe there's more social stuff that we don't really know about we can't figure it out oh probably yeah but yeah so there you go that was my those are my fun facts for the northern fur seal so i'm really glad that this one won i learned a ton of stuff on this one i did too i and i think this first time too we all had like questions during each other's thing like well wait wait what (laughs) yeah what does that mean so cool so it just as she goes to show you never you think like one like oh maybe it's it's gonna be cool but maybe other ones are gonna be cooler I think this one ended up being even cooler than the monk seal so mm-hmm. we'll see we'll see what the monk we'll probably put the monk seal up against against something else next uh, and see if it uh, maybe, what happens. maybe Hawaiian monk seal versus Mediterranean monk seal <laughs> and then, and then, but then you got the Caribbean monk seal I mean I know it's not alive anymore but it was a thing <laughs> probably good to just talk about all the monk seals there you go we'll figure it out we'll figure out something um so next week we'll ha- next uh, next episode we'll have another journal review um and be on the lookout in the future we are going to have talking about the entanglements and that kind of stuff we are going to have a very cool interview mm-hmm. um in the future i'm not sure exactly when yet um with uh, a guy that's doing ropeless technology uh, and i learned quite a few things just talking to him the other day um uh but they're a group called smelts up in um based up in uh, Bellingham, uh, not Bellingham, but a little bit northern Washington. Um, so uh, we're going to hopefully be able to have an interview with him um, and what they're doing. It's really cool stuff that they're doing. Um, so yeah. that will be something to be looking for in the future on a next on a future episode. Um, so yeah. that's it. So we will see you next time. And uh, don't forget to check out the beginning of the month is when we usually have our polls out for which marine mammal species we're going to do next in the highlight. So be sure to catch us on Facebook, Facebook, Faceback. Yeah. Facebook <laughs> and Instagram um, and just keep up to date with us on what we're doing. Um, so we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.